It was one of the worst catastrophes in all of history. Starting in southern Italy in 1347, people in harbor towns, then inland villages and towns fell terribly, horribly ill. Many crazed with pain and vomiting blood. Swellings in their armpits, neck and groin spread all over their bodies and turned into ghastly black sores. What came to be known as the Black Death killed with astonishing speed. In a few days, sometimes even less. In Florence, the writer Giovanni Boccaccio wrote that the pestilence killed so quickly that an infected person could have breakfast with friends and family and dinner with ancestors in paradise. No one was safe anywhere near the sick or the dead. Some tried to protect themselves by wearing long, waxed gowns, goggles, and beak-like masks filled with herbs to purify the air and block the stink of death and decay but they died too. Eventually, wrote Boccaccio, almost all adopted to the same cruel policy, which was entirely to avoid the sick and everything belonging to them. People by the thousands fled the cities and towns or the countryside only to find death there too. Farmers stopped tending animals and crops. There were food shortages and price hikes. Law and order broke down. Tight-knit communities broke apart, so did families. The Roman Catholic Church, a powerful force throughout medieval Europe, urged people to save themselves by praying and confessing. But God is deaf nowadays and prayers have no power, wrote English author William Langland in his epic poem, Pierce Plowman, and boldly brought down with many keen sores and slew much people. In Siena, Italy and other cities, bodies of Black Death victims were carted to mass graves. More than 500 dead were carried daily to a plague pit in Paris, wrote the monk Jean de Venet. For 21st century scientists, these 14th century plague pits hold the answer to what killed so many so quickly. DNA testing and analysis of bones and teeth dug out of mass graves in England, France and Italy have convinced many researchers that the Black Death was caused by an especially vicious strain of bacteria called Yersinia pestis or Y pestis, strains of which still exist today. Historically, Y pestis is most often carried and spread by rats, common on ships and by flea bites. Many historians and researchers believe this accounts for the spread of the Black Death on trading ships from Southwest Asia and East Asia into the harbors and along the trade routes in medieval Europe. With little understanding of what germs were or how they spread and no antibiotics to fight infection, millions died. Some historians now think the plague may have killed as many as 50 million people. The Black Death certainly ended life as medieval Europeans knew it. Death was seen as a grim dance that everyone, rich and poor, was forced to do in the end. A universal danse macabre depicted in woodcuts, murals, paintings. The established power structure, the church and the ruling classes could not stop or control the plague. Those who survived began to question the authority of the bishops and the nobles. With so many dead, there were labor shortages across Europe. The workers who were left demanded higher wages, but were refused. By the end of the 14th century, peasant revolts broke out in Italy, France and England. At the same time, the breakdown of the feudal social order would pave the way for change in philosophy, science and culture in Europe that would become known as the Renaissance. A little short little video there, of course, uh, on the Black Death, which I will talk about, of course, which was one of the major events that happened, of course, in the late Middle Ages. So anyway, I welcome you back. Of course, Daniel Simon at Baton Rouge Community College. Hope you're having a great week out there. Uh, as you know, week seven, of course, summer semester, history 11, 13, you know, we're pretty much wrapping up uh, the semester. Uh, so, of course, be my last lecture uh, for the summer, uh, of course, which is on this uh, Middle Ages, of course, series I'm doing, of course, this week. So, so anyway, it uh, looks like we have a few students watching right now live. Uh, Tonica, hey, good morning. Hope you're having a great time out there uh, in the semester. Uh, Nadia, hey, good morning uh, also as well. Uh, looks like we also got Madison watching right now. Good morning. 
Uh, Trey, hey, what's going on? Uh, Ashley's also watching right now. And also it looks like Jessica just joined us uh, also as well. So uh, anyway, before we get started, I do want to talk about a few announcements and reminders, of course, uh, about the end of the semester. Um, yeah, as of now, y'all have got a bunch of assignments out, uh, which uh, these are the ones, I guess, pretty much uh, that I've got kind of coming up for, I guess, this weekend and next week uh, that we've got. Uh, but we got the, of course, the two Roman quizzes, of course, I've got six and seven. Uh, those, of course, will not be on the final exam, as you know. Uh, so try to wrap those up. Uh, also, the book reports are due next week, starting Monday uh, as well. Uh, and then the final exam will be due. Uh, I've pretty much already posted it this morning. Uh, if anybody wants to start working on it, uh, that'll be due, of course, next Friday. Uh, I believe that's the 23rd of July. Uh, which is due at noon instead of midnight, of course. So um, anyway, uh, vocab, of course, that third vocab, uh, I think it's still open right now. If you have not turned that in, I think you have till Friday tomorrow to get that wrapped up. Uh, now, of course, there will be some exemptions on the final. As you know, uh, some students, of course, have high high grades going into the final, like 96% or higher. Uh, so if you in that range, you probably will be exempt, but... Uh, you need to make sure you complete all your assignments, of course, uh, to stay, keep that exemption anyway. Uh, and I'll, I'll also be sending out some kind of uh, probably email. I don't know when exactly over the weekend or really be an announcement, I guess, more than anything with Canvas about who's exempt, of course, uh, from the final and all that. It's like Devin's joining us uh, also as well. Uh, we'll have another review, too. Like there'll be like a review for the final, which I think is a previous recorded one have, but uh, on the study guide sections on the Middle Ages. That'll be included also with the exam as well, which you'll see with the assignment later. So it's kind of reminding about all the things that are uh, due coming up. Uh, of course, I will continue to send out you know, reminders like emails and so on about things coming up that are due uh, for the end of the semester and all that. And if you have any questions about the class, you know, you can always, you know, send me comments, questions, you know, via my email uh, like you pretty much all I have been doing you know, throughout the summer. So uh, anyway, today I'm going to, of course, wrap up my last lecture uh, on the Middle Ages. Uh, pretty much our topics today are going to be, well, I'll talk about the rise of the Mongols and all these different, you know, states that kind of emerge afterwards uh, due to, to like the Mongol Empire that forms. So I'll talk about that today. Uh, I'll also talk about the late Middle Ages. I'm again like talking about the Black Death. You know, one of the main things, of course, I could get to today. Hundred Years' War. I'll talk about that. It was kind of a major conflict that happened in the Middle Ages. That's real, real well known. Uh, then I'll talk about one of the most famous things in the late, late Middle Ages. Of course, you see a lot of paintings like in the back, like Mona Lisa, the Renaissance, uh, probably the most famous thing. Uh, so we'll get to that. So if you have any comments, questions about this lecture or previous lectures, you know, let me know. Of course, on my YouTube channel, uh, where we got, like I said, a comment or something, a question about the class, just you can email me uh, pretty much later. Uh, here, of course, the link to StreamYard.com, of course, if you want to join me uh, also as well. So uh, anyway, from last last lecture, of course, at part two, of course, on the Middle Ages, I had discussed primarily some of the major events that happened like in the central part of the Middle Ages, like the, the rise of the, the so-called Viking Age, I think was one of the things that we got gone into. Uh, and then I did talk about the Crusades. The Crusades is probably one of the most famous events that happened in the Middle Ages. I say Crusades and the Renaissance, really those two things, the biggest ones uh, that happened. So yeah, I'm going to move on uh, to talk about also the Mongols uh, that are kind of pretty famous uh, that kind of appear, you know, during the, you know, the kind of the, I guess the middle or later part of the Middle Ages that you get uh, that comes in, uh, and uh, the, the the Mongols um, uh, was an empire that kind of formed in the 13th century, uh, and it's around to like the 14th century, and I think afterwards there's actually these various relic type states that kind of survive afterwards uh, that exist at one point. Uh, you can see Genghis Khan there, you know, of course one of the founders of it, uh, that's well known. Uh, and uh, the Mongols are pretty famous for a lot of things. They changed pretty much the world a lot, especially in Europe and Asia, uh, especially demographically, which I'll kind of explain about that uh, a little later. 
Uh, but yeah, it was one of the largest uh, empires ever in history at one point. Uh, I think the, they say that the the uh, Mongol Empire may have been almost like 10 million square miles. Uh, I think the only thing that's close close to it is probably the British Empire, which you can see reached maybe 12, 13 million uh, square miles at one point, up to probably up to the 19th, 20th century. So that's kind of amazing right there if you think about how, how large the Mongol Empire was. I do have maps showing you uh, the Mongol Empire, like the spread of it uh, and all that, which I can kind of show you right here. But you, you can see it kind of it was a type of empire that started obviously in Mongolia. So these are Mongolian Asiatic peoples that basically spread from Mongolia uh, into like China, took over China and East Asia, Korea uh, also as well. Uh, they spread westward into Tibet. Uh, you can see they went all the way into Russia at one point. Uh, even got into parts of northern India, Pakistan, uh, Persia at one point, Iraq. Uh, you can see, they think at one point that the uh, Mongols may have actually reached all the way to, uh, you can see here, uh, Poland and Hungary, the uh, far west they got. Just pretty amazing. It's, that's you know, amazing how far west they got. Uh, at one point, almost reaching like the Byzantine Empire, you know, over here in the Mediterranean Sea. So, so obviously that was something that they're kind of, you know, well known for. Uh, and um, of course, we talked about, you know, the founder of, you know, uh, the Mongol Empire, which of course was Genghis Khan, who Genghis Khan is more of a title uh, that he went by, which means uh, it usually means a universal ruler, uh, kind of like emperor. Uh, kind of, that's kind of what it meant. But his real name was Temujin, uh, and uh, he formed the bulk of the empire in the early part of the, the 13th century. Uh, and his his forces, of course, eventually would, you know, uh, I think he conquered, I want to say 80% or more of the empire uh, at one point uh, through his campaigns east to west across parts of your Asia. Uh, they also say Chinggis Khan, I think, is the common uh, way they say it, like in Mongolia, of course, today, uh, also as well. Hey, Daph, what's going on? Also this morning, uh, as well. Uh, also, um, they had different nicknames that the Mongols were also called as well. Uh, a lot of people called the Devil's Horsemen. I don't know if you know about that. Devil's Horsemen. They often fought on horseback. Uh, practically lived in the, on the horse. Uh, the Mongols, and. Um, they call it devil's horsemen because a lot of people thought they were sent by the devil or whatever to, to punish them, especially I think Christians, I think, more or less later, kind of give them that name. Uh, they're often called the Mongol horde. The term horde was often used because a lot of the Mongols would divide themselves up into tribal groups called a horde, since the name being used. Well, use that. That, that was often a common term. They used Mongol horde uh, being used. Russia, they called the golden horde was another name. Uh, they got because they were forced to pay like a lot of money to like gold tribute to, I guess, prevent them from sacking their people and all that. But uh, that is one thing that they're very famous for, the Mongols. The Mongols uh, committed mass genocide uh, as they went from pretty much uh, east to west across Asia and Europe. They created a lot, of, a lot of great demographic change. And, of course, they were known for mass genocide where they just wiped out hundreds of cities and villages just killed everybody uh, in their wake. Um, I've got like 30, 40 million they think that possibly the Mongol invasions may have actually caused. Uh, but I've, I've seen some numbers as high as like 50 to 60 million. Uh, there's even a theory that the Mongol invasions of Asia and Europe may have caused the uh, world population to, to drop by 10 to 11 percent, which is amazing. It's like almost in comparison with the Black Death. It wiped out a lot of people, too, uh, also as well. So that's something that, that they're very famous for, committing mass genocide as they conquered vast amounts of territory uh, throughout those regions. Now, the only thing that happened, those, uh, I think if you study about after Genghis Khan died, it was kind of like a civil war among his sons and all that. And uh, what happened later, his empire eventually broke up. Here's kind of a map showing the... Um, basically the empire itself, 
uh, as the expand. In fact, here show kind of a here's one map showing you uh, the expansion of the empire as it got bigger and bigger. I think that kind of shows you right there. But kind of you can see it kind of expands over time, right there. But um, this map here shows you more or less the areas that it would eventually break up into, um, which would be like these four khanates that'll form later, so-called Mongol khanates. Uh, and uh, a khan, by the way, was what they called their leaders. The word khan meant leader or, I don't know, maybe it meant like kind of like a king, basically. Great khan, I think, was the common term uh, they would use like for leaders like Genghis Khan and so on. So it means great, I guess, great leader, basically. That's what it means. And um, you can see there's four of them. They got the uh, Khanate of the Great Khan, which was sometimes called the Yuan uh, Dynasty or Yuan State, which is mostly China, Mongolia, which was over here. Uh, they got the Khanate uh, of the Golden Horde in Russia, uh, Ukraine. Uh, the Chagatay Khanate, which here is kind of like in like that central part of Asia here above India. And then, yeah, the Il Khanate uh, also state in like around Persia, Persia, Iraq, and Afghanistan in those areas. So that's kind of the areas that they kind of break it up uh, over time. Uh, the ones that are the most famous they had, though, was the Yuan one I'm talking about. Of course, that one was... Uh, famously founded by uh, Genghis Khan's grandson, you may have heard of, named Kublai Khan, who became emperor of China. So he kind of created this imperial China because like in the 1220s, I think it was, the Mongols attacked through the Great Wall and took over China uh, between the 13th and the 14th centuries uh, right there. Uh, and uh, Kublai Khan uh, ruled as emperor from like about 1271 to 1294. First non-Han emperor, by the way. Uh, they hadn't really had any other emperors that weren't from Han Chinese. Uh, so they, you have the Mongols ruling as emperors for a short time there, uh, believe it or not. So they controlled China, uh, Mongolia, and also Korea. And I think uh, Kublai Khan also tried to attack Japan, uh, crossing the Sea of Japan, but he was uh, there, his forces were wiped out by some kind of uh, bad storms, like a cyclones or something like that. Hey, Nat, we're having a great morning uh, also uh, as well. So, uh, so yeah, yeah, they had that. Uh, then also you said one that's kind of that yellow area that they had uh, as well. Kind of mentioned about that one uh, as well. They ha also had the um, one that's called the Golden Horde Khanate. Uh, this was a, a Russian Khanate that was founded by Batu Khan, who was one of Genghis Khan's grandsons that kind of attacked westward towards like Russia and the Ukraine and Eventually, they sacked Kiev well, at one point, the capital of one of their main cities in, in Ukraine. And um, what happened was interesting about a lot of these states, especially in the western part of the, the Mongol Empire. Uh, they, they, the, uh, if you know about the Mongols came into contact with Turkish peoples, and the two cultures kind of synthesized or assimilated uh, into each other. So you get this Turco-Mongol culture that kind of merges and uh, even the Mongols become later Muslim a lot, you know, especially in the West and all that. And, and anyway, uh, in Russia, they call them Tatars, if you know about that. Uh, and so they talk about the Tatar yoke and all that that controls Russia. And I think in Russia, they call them the Golden Horde because of the fact that they were forced to pay them like gold tribute. But they say it's also because the Tatars li li lived in these golden colored tents, hence the name being used also as well. Hey, Mark, I hope you're having a great morning also out there as well. So, yeah, that's the kind of like the, the Mongols, how they kind of, you know, create all this chaos in different states afterwards. And you get you get different states that kind of uh, kind of break away uh, afterwards. Like uh, there's one that's called that's real famous that kind of broke away uh, from the Ilkhanate. Say, there's, of course, statue of Genghis Khan right there you're looking at. But they have this one that was called the Timurid uh, or Tamerlane's empire that formed uh, later, uh, which uh, was a Turco-Mongol state, you know, where the Turks and Mongols kind of merged together. But also the Persian people also as well kind of mixed in there too as well. Uh, they kind of all three kind of mix uh, those, those cultures. Uh, we get this new empire that forms in the 14th century, uh, which uh, the, the ruler that formed it 
uh, was a man named, uh, here's a picture of him right there, but his name was uh, Timur, uh, who was also called Tamerlane, was his other name uh, he went by. So I think it was a slur of the, the name Timur the Lame, because he walked with like a limp. So I guess it must have been a war wound or something like that. Uh, and so that's where the name Tamerlane came from uh, over time. And he was this warlord and um, Turco-Mongol uh, type leader, political leader, I guess, uh, that controlled uh, most of like the Middle East from like Iraq into Iran. And he controlled some territory all the way to the Indus River, like around Afghanistan, Pakistan. And so, um, and that that's kind of why, you know, you get, you know, Islam spread eastward over time because you get these different empires uh, that exists there, and that they say that the um, the uh, the Timur Empire is what led to the uh, Mughal Empire uh, forming later as well. The Mughal Empire, which will kind of break away from that, will kind of birth it. Uh, and Mughal Empire was this empire that controlled most of India later. It was established later, not more like in the early. This might get more into the early modern times. Uh, the Mughal Empire, but. That's an empire that they do think was somehow descended uh, from uh, the, the Turco-Mongol cultures because uh, you've got Babur, who was the guy that founded the Mughal Empire uh, and, uh, in the 1520s. Uh, and he was actually descended of basically you have Timur on one side, you know, through his father, uh, which I guess was the, you know, Turks. And then you got Genghis Khan through his mother with the Mongols that you have. So, They'll go in there and control it. And Mughal Empire is in there for a while. They control, like, you know, at one point India up to, like, the uh, 19th century. But because of the Europeans coming in, like the British and so on, that caused their empire later to decline. And the British Empire would have, of course, a major effect on that part of the world, like in South Asia. So all these were kind of like these, you know, derivative states that kind of formed, you know, after... Uh, you know, the Mongols and what they did throughout most of like Asia, et cetera. All right, I'm going to move on to talk about some of the major events that, of course, occurred in the uh, Middle Ages. I want to talk about, I want to get into, we'll discuss some of these topics, of course, I've got up there. You know, like the Black Death is one of the big things I'll talk about first. We'll get into that. Uh, then I'll talk about the Hundred Years War. You can see kind of Joan of Arc in that picture there, of course, I've got. Then I'll get into the Renaissance. Renaissance, of course, the most famous event that really happened in the later part of, of, of the Middle Ages. And yeah, yeah, the uh, the uh, outbreak of the bubonic plague, that's one thing that's real famous, you know, uh, about, you know, the, the, the late Middle Ages, which uh, if you know much about the Black Death, it was this massive pandemic uh, that killed millions uh, in parts of Europe, uh, Asia, uh, they think also North Africa uh, as well. Uh, really started like around the 1340s and into the 1350s, but it was a type of pandemic that was around up to modern times. I think up to like the 19th century, I know it was a kind of a problem. Uh, and they say it killed more people uh, in history than any other plague. Well, they, I think when they say plague, they mean pretty much bubonic uh, plague, uh, more or less. Uh, here's an estimate, but they think that it could have. They, I know they said in the video 50 million, but I think there's some theories back in history, like world history in general, that the plague may have killed anywhere from 100 to 200 million people worldwide. So you can go all the way back to the time of like the Greeks uh, and the Roman Empire, uh, the Byzantine Empire under Justinian. Uh, so there's been multiple times where the bubonic plague uh, may have killed people uh, in history. Uh, so all the way up from, you know, it's up to like maybe the 1800s in modern times, uh, more or less. And uh, in Europe, they think it may have killed 25 million people so much that it may have killed like anywhere from like a third of the population to maybe even close to a half of the population wiped out. So whole villages were just totally destroyed, uh, you know, by the plague uh, as it ravished different parts of it. Uh, there's different maps showing the spread of the plague that they always talk about. Well, I'll kind of share with you, but they think the plague likely originated somewhere in Asia. I think Central Asia has been kind of a theory of where it came from. Maybe even China. A lot of different illnesses have originated in China, like the swine flu 
Uh, some think COVID, they think originated, you know, in, from a, uh, from China, also as well. A lot of it was uh, came down, came from east to west because of trade routes, like the Silk Road that ran, you know, westward toward the Middle East, uh, in the Black Sea. Also, the Mongols, the Mongols helped spread it too. Also, as they conquered east to west, uh, they brought the plague with them. Uh, in fact, the Mongols would often use um, uh, bodies, like dead bodies with plague to, to wipe out cities. They would actually catapult them uh, into people's like cities and stuff like that uh, to kind of like germ warfare to, to basically kill off full populations. So they obviously knew something about it. But um, you can see how the plague kind of, they think, crept through the ports. So they think it was caused by primarily... They think what happened was, of course, spread by black rats. Black rats was the common carrier of the plague uh, with the rat flea uh, carrying it in their stomach, uh, the bacterium. And um, they think uh, they think that most Italian trading ships, like from the Genoese, I think being the main ones, uh, brought the plague uh, from the Black Sea region to Italy. And then from there, it spread northward through Europe uh, is what happened. They talked about the different, um, you know, the what caused it, and all, like the cause of the plague uh, and all that, which I told you most of it was caused uh, by, of course, rats uh, that spread through fleas. And, uh, of course, they talked about in the video how there was this bacterium in the flea's stomach uh, called Yersinia pestis, which was actually named after uh, this doctor. I think it was a Swiss-French doctor named Alexander Yersin who discovered it in 1896. I think he was working for the Pasteur uh, Institute or something like that and discovered what caused it and all that. And so, um, but back then people didn't, people didn't know that, like what caused, you know, the actual plague uh, and all that. But the symptoms of the plague, of course, uh, you know, vary, but the main ones that they talk about that are, of course, famous or the famous bobos that they would get uh, around their neck, around their groin area, around their armpits, uh, which would you know bleed uh, like pus uh, and blood. Uh, so that was like one of the main things. Uh, they, they would get extreme pain, black spots or blotches on the skin, like the skin would really like rot and die off. Uh, so that's kind of why they called it black death also later, a black plague. Uh, violent coughing of blood and things like that were, were all often uh, other causes. And I think they said it could spread different ways. Like there's different ways that the plague could spread, like through the air, through contact and th respiratory you know, ways, droplets and things like that were different ways that it could spread, uh, that, that you could actually get it, uh, more or less. Uh, the Catholic Church believed that about 23 million may have died uh, from the actual plague. Um, so that, that's, that might be close, you know, 20, 25 million might be the actual amount, which might be true. Here's a kind of a bobo, of course, people would get uh, like on their, on their, you know, like back of their neck and things like that. And people still use that today. You know, like when they get like a, I, I still use it sometimes. I get like a little cut or something. Oh, I got a little bobo on me. That's kind of where that, of course, comes from uh, more or less. Uh, now, uh, medieval people, uh, you know, they, they had different names for the plague. Uh, they, they didn't call it Black Death or uh, Black Plague or Bubonic Plague. Th those are more modern names that started to be used later. Uh, the common names they used were the Great Pestilence. Uh, was something they used. Uh, great Mortality, which obviously means Great Death because of the amount of people that died. Of course, some people think it was called Black Death because of the amount of people that died, like all the people that were wiped out course, by the plague. Uh, it's not really till the 17th century that you really have, you know, the, the name or nickname Black Death or Black Plague really being used. I think by the time of the Great Plague of London, which happened 1665, 1666, which killed 100,000 or more people like in England, um, I think they started using it then. Um, but plague, plague, you know, it affected, like if you study about Napoleon's troops when they invaded Egypt in 1798, some of his forces were actually riddled with bubonic plague. So it's quite common, uh, like a setup to like 
close to the 19th century of people getting it. Uh, what did medieval people believe that caused the plague? Well, there's all kinds of things that they think caused the plague. I kind of got a list of them right here, <laughs> but some blame God. You know, the fact that they weren't going to church, you know, things like that. So they thought God was punishing the, them for their sins, uh, things like that. The devil, like Satan, uh, was behind it, uh, causing all these people to die. Uh, lack of um, religion, you see there, yeah, of course, was a big one they talked about a lot. Uh, the, the Jews, a lot of people blame the Jews. They thought the Jews had poisoned the wells, and that's why people were dying. And so a lot of Jews were killed during the Black Death because they thought they were behind it. Witchcraft, you know, demon stuff, you know, dealing with demons and uh, bad spirits, uh, those are also causes too. Uh, so you start to see witch hunts uh, in Europe take off. Uh, a lot of women were accused of uh, maybe causing bubonic plague, uh, things like that. Uh, astrology. It was all, all the scholars, like at university, like university of Paris and other famous, you know, college at the time uh, in modern Europe, thought uh, that maybe there was a conjunction of the planets where the planets had lined up a certain way, and that it caused the plague. Also, uh, the closest theory that people got to the plague, which was very popular, by the way was miasma, the miasma theory, which was this belief that if you uh, breathe in bad air, like foul air, like smell it, uh, that it'll make you ill. Uh, and so that's why people started wearing all these masks that you start seeing uh, during the Black during the black Death. They're kind of like these beak-looking masks, like this one right here uh, that you're looking at. And they thought they put scents or flowers in there that smelled good. They didn't smell like the smell of dead and bodies and all that, they wouldn't get the plague. Uh, but of course, they wore the mask and they died anyway. <laughs> so uh, the masks really don't stop the actual, you know, germs going through it. So because there's too, just, unless you got something that kind of can stop it, but it's going to go right through it. So yeah, uh, later, of course, they abandoned that theory, you know, um, I think by the late, late 1800s, they, they figure out that, you know, most illnesses are caused by germ theory you know, germs causing it, bacteria, viruses, and other things like that uh, today. So that's, the, back then they didn't know that, you know, what actually caused it. And they didn't know about the rats and the rat fleas, you know, being the carriers of it. But I think they say that the, the black rat was one of the main rats that carried it, like the rat fleas, whatever. But the brown rat later became the dominant rat uh, later in Europe. And so that helped to kind of, you know, eventually cause its decline, I think they say. All right. Um, anyway, um, I want to get into next. I want to talk about as well uh, uh, one of the major events that's real famous uh, in, of course, the really in the late Middle Ages is the Hundred Years War. Uh, that, of course, was a major conflict uh, that occurred that really uh, changed Europe quite a lot. Uh, the Hundred Years War was a major war that was fought between England and France. Uh, it's one of the bloodiest conflicts in the middle, probably top five. I don't think it was the bloodiest, but it was one of the top five uh, bloodiest conflicts, uh, possibly causing somewhere between two to three million people dead, like in, in the conflict, uh, which was mostly fought in France, uh, where it was fought. And it's one of the longest wars in medieval history. You can see 1337 to 1453. They weren't fighting like the whole time. I think it's like 100 and... I forget what is 116 years, I think, off and on. Uh, but it was like a series of wars uh, that were fought uh, between between both sides. Uh, and um, what caused the war uh, was the fact that you had these two rival dynasties that wanted to control all of France. Uh, the two dynasties, by the way, were the House of Valois, uh, which controlled France, the Kingdom of France and all that, and the House of the Plantagenet dynasty. Uh, which was sometimes called Angevin, by the way, uh, as well, which was English. Uh, those were pretty famous dynasties uh, in the Middle Ages. Uh, Valois was a new dynasty, which had replaced the Capetian dynasty because uh, one of the last kings of, of that dynasty had died. Uh, and they had a, what, what caused the war to break out, uh, there was a, there was a dynastic dispute over the French throne. The king of France, who was Charles IV that died, he was the last major ruler 
of the Capetian dynasty, which went all the way back to Hugh Capet, uh, who was like one of the first kings of what they call the King of France, uh, formed, I think, around the 10th century. Uh, and um, he had a nephew named King Edward III of England who basically sought the throne because uh, he was like the close heir. Uh, but he didn't want to give it to him. He gave it, I think, to another nephew. And so that what, that's what caused the war. Now, if you look at this map of, um, I think I've got a map showing you of, um, of, uh, of like France at the time, uh, one of the territories up here they fought over was Aquitaine. Aquitaine, I think, was believed to be one of the main areas that really caused the war. Uh, the, uh, the English still controlled some territory in France. They controlled Calais, around Calais, up here. Sierra Bordeaux, Bordeaux is around Aquitaine. They controlled this area as well. And um, basically, the French didn't want the English to control that. And so they, they say that's what caused the war uh, to break out. It was like the flashpoint that really, you know, caused, you know, the Hundred Years' War to break out. And uh, the wars actually went through a series of conflicts. It was like, I think, three stages of the war at one point. Uh, where they have the Edwardian part of the war where Edward, you know, would fight King Edward III. And I think there's the Carol, Carol, the Caroline War, too, uh, which was like where the King Charles VI and VII of France fought against the English. And they have the Lancast, Lancastrian, of course, uh, stage of the war where the Lancastrian kings and, of course, in England fought also as well. So kind of goes through a lot of stages, you know, multiple generations you know, fighting in the Hundred Years' War and all that. And it did have a lot of major implications, not just in France, between France and England, but it did affect Europe overall afterwards. Now, um, talk about as well technology, because that's one thing that's well known, you know, about the Hundred Years' War. The Hundred Years' War uh, is one of those first wars that really changed warfare. Uh, they think that uh, in a sense that um, it induced it induced like new weapons uh, technology in the war. Uh, another thing about the Hundred Years' War, Hundred Years' War was considered like one of the first modernized wars, where uh, you have like new kinds of weapons being introduced, like the so-called um, cannon is introduced uh, into the war, which I think was being developed already, like in the Ottoman Empire in the East, in China. Uh, gunpowder weapons, firearms, you know, start coming in. The, I think later they have the, uh, the um, arquebus, arquebus, of course, happened later, will have. But um, also feudal warfare will kind of come to an end. You'll start seeing, you know, in medieval times, they mostly had knights on horseback fighting a lot with nobility mostly doing all the fighting in, in, in the Middle Ages. Uh, but you'll see, you'll start seeing like peasants, you know, starting to fight. Uh, other social classes and things like that. And that also changes a lot of warfare uh, as well. Uh, the English uh, introduced a new weapon uh, during the Hundred Years' War, which gave them a lot of advantages, which is the long bow. It was a new type of bow and arrow uh, that could fire uh, arrows at a longer distance. And it was a major advantage, especially against, you know, mounted cavalry. Uh, and um, they could just hire peasants, basically, to, you know, fire uh, arrows at them, and it was a major effect in some of the battles. In fact, a lot of the early battles, like Battle of Crecy, Battle of Poitiers, uh, Battle of Agincourt in 1450, uh, were, were major, uh, you know, strategic battles that England used to take control uh, of, especially northern France, I know, uh, in the war. And so a lot of these new, new kinds of weaponry were, were kind of an advantage uh, in the war. I think England had better better military the French had, and better leadership uh, also as well, especially early on. Uh, so you can see that the longbow being used right there. Here's, the long, of course, the longbow, of course, uh, being used by a bunch of archers right there. Uh, also, other other types of weapons, too, you may have heard of, like uh, the French developed, like, you know, various siege engines, like the trebuchet uh, you're looking at. Uh, which the trebuchet is a type of uh, catapult that could fire projectiles like three, four hundred yards, uh, which could take out fortified walls, castles, uh, things like that. Uh, so that was kind of another weapon that was kind of 
uh, used by both sides in the war. And that also kind of helped to make a lot of fortifications and castles kind of obsolete. Uh, and, but that's before they have cannons and they have started cannons. And that's you know, eventually going to make a lot of those kind of things you know, obsolete uh, over time eventually. So those are other things that kind of, you know, help to modernize warfare. They'll start using armor and things like that, but uh, they're using too. But I think a lot of that kind of goes away eventually. Uh, now, um, also, uh, I'll kind of talk about the turning point in the war, uh, which uh, if you go up to like 1450, the Battle of Agincourt, you know, the, the English were winning the war. They almost taken over almost half of France at that point. Even take a lot of the major cities like Paris had fallen uh, pretty much the English. We look at this map here. Uh, they kind of show you uh, this kind of the stages that the war kind of goes into uh, right here. Uh, but you can see here, uh, like up, um, you can see the beginning of the war right here. But if you go like over here, they start taking, they took control of this area here at one point, which they lost later. But by the uh, early part of the 15th century, you can see here they've taken pretty much northern France from Brittany, Normandy, the Champagne area uh, of France. Uh, so they control a lot of the major cities. Paris, Rouen uh, were also controlled by them. Reims was also controlled. And they're also trying to take Orléans uh, also right here, which is another major city in the north uh, that was important. Uh, and so... Um, However, they think that the war kind of changed because of Joan of Arc. She's often considered, you know, one of the major influences that really uh, changes the outcome of the war. Uh, Joan of Arc, you know, was a very famous woman in French history, like modern, modern, modern French times, you know. Uh, and um, she's known as Jeanne d'Arc, which, of course, in the West, they call it Joan of Arc, as you know. Uh, often known as the so-called Maid of Orleans. Uh, and uh, she was this young woman who was a teenager that had visions uh, where she was visited by, I think, one of the uh, archangels, St. Michael, and a few other saints. Uh, and she was told to uh, aid uh, the king the king of um, France, which I think at the time was Charles VII, or actually he wasn't even crowned. Was, I think that was one thing about him. Of course, we know about him. He was the Dauphine or... The rule that need to be crowned, and so she's important. Uh, 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 Joan of Arc is important in aiding Charles the Seventh, uh, his military forces, in lifting the siege of Orleans, or really Orleans, so they say it. And um, they think that was important. the The uh, siege of Orleans is the watershed moment uh, or event, you know, turning point, you know, of the whole Hundred Years' War. Uh, when the French were able to overcome uh, that siege and uh, retake the city. Uh, from there, it, it kind of helped to rally the French uh, against the English. And then from there, the, the as you know, what happened after that was the, the, the French basically rolled up the English and basically within uh, 20, 30 years, uh, they retook most of, of, of France, uh, minus, I think, Calais uh, was about it. So she's definitely considered to be you know, a, a, a hero that's really uh, important uh, with modern France today. Uh, later, as you know, she was captured uh, in try, try, put on trial. Uh, she was put on trial for mostly heresy. I think they accused her of also witchcraft as well. And she was burned at the stake uh, is what happened to her at the age of 19 in 1431. Uh, so, but later on the Catholic Church, as you know, uh, made her into a saint in 1920. Uh, so she's kind of been canonized and all that uh, by, by, the, by, the, by the Catholic Church, et cetera. So um, why, why is the Hundred years, years War important? Well, uh, the Hundred Years War is very important because the fact that it kind of creates uh, an independent, you know, French and Engl English states. Uh, they'll, they'll kind of separate from each other uh, afterwards. Uh, both both states become very nationalized, uh, as you know, uh, and the rivalries there afterwards, pretty much England and France are, are major rivals uh, throughout modern times, even up to like the time of Napoleon, et cetera. So that's something that's constantly there. And even today, France and England are still, you know, rivals. I think mostly it's in sports now, like 
football or rugby or whatever it is. Um, you still got that going on. Uh, but uh, but they think the Hundred Years' War kind of kind of contributed to change, you know, Europe overall, uh, like warfare. Uh, I think it changed a lot of international diplomacy between countries afterwards because of the fact that the war was so awful, uh, more, more or less. All right, I'm also going to move on today. Of course, the last thing I'll talk about uh, is the so-called Renaissance. So I did want to get into that and mention about that uh, as well because, you know, the Renaissance was obviously – uh, the most famous event, really, you know, of the whole uh, Middle Age, especially the late Middle Ages, which uh, you can see it peaked between the 13th, 13th, 14th centuries, kind of when it gets started. And it goes all the way up to like about the 16th century. I think up to the like 1500s, at least, it kind of may have uh, affected, affected Europe at one point. Uh, what exactly was the Renaissance? I've got kind of a definition of it for you, but it was a kind of an intellectual cultural type movement uh, that started in Europe, uh, started in Italy, originally, like Northern Italy mostly, it's where it began. A lot of their cities like Florence, you may have heard of, Genoa, Venice, started in Rome uh, as well. And it was a transitional period, but between like the Middle Age, Dark Ages uh, that we talked about and the modern times uh, that come in. So a lot of, a lot of historians think the Renaissance uh, was – uh, kind of the period that kind of started the modern times, uh, especially in Europe. Uh, the term Renaissance is a word that means rebirth. So it's like a rebirth of culture, rebirth of art, rebirth in uh, civilization, uh, science, math, all kinds of uh, culture uh, in general uh, that affected, uh, you know, uh, Europe late architecture. You know, you could pretty much name anything. Paintings obviously were influenced by it uh, also as well. Uh, they do think that the Renaissance uh, was heavily influenced by Greco-Roman culture. They talk about this so-called classical revival, you know, that occurs uh, in, the, in the late Middle Ages, uh, where a lot of um, scholars began to kind of restudy the past. They looked at all this old pagan stuff uh, that had been there, like writings and so on, literature, history, and whatever. And they began to restudy it. And uh, the men that did that or women that did that uh, were became what they call humanists. Uh, so you get this so-called Renaissance uh, humanism movement that kind of takes off. And uh, humanism um, was a type of, um, uh, of, of scholarly movement where there was a revival in classical antiquity, uh, where they began to restudy, like I said, like these things of the past, you know, whether they're reading, you know, Plutarch and, uh, you know, Herodotus and other types of authors that had existed a long time ago uh, in general. And uh, the father of the Renaissance and, and also the father of humanism uh, is the Italian writer uh, Petrarch, uh, who lived in the 1300s. Uh, they think he was one of the first to really restudy uh, the past, like all the pagan literature uh, that had been around. I think he started to translate it in a different language, like Italian or whatever, uh, so people could read it in their vernacular uh, type language. So that's something you start seeing, like in Italy, they start writing in like Italian instead of like, say, Latin, uh, more or less. And so that that gave birth to what we call afterwards, a lot of things, they start calling this the so-called humanities uh, that, that develop. Uh, and you start seeing people study all kinds of things in the past. They start studying, you know, history, uh, philosophy poetry, literature, uh, and so on, uh, that was from like a long time ago that was there. Because a lot of that had been prevented by the Catholic Church. They didn't want you to read certain things like that. Uh, but in Italy, they began to kind of, you know, look at that more. Uh, historians believe that the Renaissance started mostly in Florence. Florence is kind of seen as the birthplace uh, of the Renaissance. Um, like, the Tuscany area, which is like northern Italy, basically. And Florence was, by the way, it was the capital of, of what they call the Florence Republic, uh, which uh, was considered one of the most you know, influential republics at that time uh, in early modern times. Uh, Florence became, by the way, uh, the me medieval center of European trade. That's one thing it was known for. Uh, in fact, through finance, uh, the, the so-called Florentine money, which is called Flor the Florin, you know about that, was almost like the dollar today. 
Uh, that's how powerful their money was uh, in general. Uh, they believe how the Renaissance got started uh, was that they had these wealthy families, like the, you've heard of the Medici family. It's like well-known, of course, in Florence, Italy. Uh, they think what happened was they made a lot of money off of trade, and they took that wealth, and they started patronizing, you know, artists in general. Um, and so that's what led to the beginning of, they think, the Renaissance. So they spent like millions of dollars, you know, artwork, statues and paintings and building buildings and so on. And they think that's how the Renaissance got going uh, overall. And I think they say that the Florence and other of these Italian cities like Venice and so on, uh, Genoa, uh, they all became wealthy because of like uh, the Asian trade with the East uh, due to the impact of the Crusades uh, and the Silk Road and all that. And so that's what kind of caused it, you know, later. Uh, the Renaissance is usually subdivided, by the way. They have the so-called early Renaissance, which the early Renaissance is mostly 14th, 15th century, I guess the peak of it uh, predominantly, mostly in Italy, northern Italy, uh, more than anything. High Renaissance also as well uh, is kind of like early 16th century uh, as well. That was the peak of Renaissance art uh, in general. And that's where you get all these um, famous artists like Da Vinci, Michelangelo, they kind of uh, have the peak of their art artwork uh, at the time. Uh, they also had the so-called Northern Renaissance when uh, what happened was the Renaissance spread from Italy uh, to the rest of Europe uh, and it went into like, you know, Germany, uh, France, England, uh, and other countries, you know, throughout Europe uh, as well. The Northern Renaissance, by the way, affected, they think, uh, the age of discovery. Like Christopher Columbus was a Renaissance man. If you know about that, of course. Um, they think it influenced like William Shakespeare, you know, stuff like that. Jeffrey Chaucer, you know, of course, uh, wrote, wrote their different works, of course, later. Uh, they do think the Renaissance affected the Reformation uh, also as well. Because, uh, you know, you got the um, uh, John Gutenberg, you know, invents the printing press and all that. And that also affected, you know, the world uh, as well later. Now, of course, we'll get into and talk about, you know, the so-called high renaissance. You got all these different, you know, uh, the peak period of the high renaissance you see there uh, with these different artists here. Uh, but you got these masters you're looking at, of course, uh, in that picture. Uh, you got, you know. Raphael, Sanzio, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, Michelangelo. Uh, those are all considered some of the great artists that were part uh, of the high Renaissance uh, that were there. Uh, I, I didn't talk about all the different artists. Before I get into them, let me do mention about some of the other artists that were also well known uh, before them. I've got a bunch of them here I can kind of share with you that were, I think these were more into the early Renaissance uh, that you had. Uh, as well, but you had like, um, don't forget about Dante. I forgot about him. Dante's kind of an important, you know, uh, artist in the Renaissance. Uh, I think they consider him to be the greatest uh, Renaissance poet, especially in Italian, uh, of course. We wrote the Divine Comedy in the early 1300s. And uh, his was actually one of the first works that was written in like vernacular of Italian, uh, you know, Tuscany type languages. Uh, and so, uh, his work, The Divine Comedy, was this medieval work where it kind of gave you kind of this uh, medieval view of the afterlife, you know, you know, heaven, hell, and you know, purgatory, uh, and all that. And so his his work was kind of influential. They think he was heavily influenced by some of the uh, earlier epics, like the Aeneid, you know, by Virgil and things like that, uh, from a long time ago. So a lot of these artists are kind of copying some of the old Greco-Roman type artists uh, from a long time ago. Uh, Giovanni Boccaccio, of course, they talked about in the little video, of course, another famous writer, poet, uh, who's well known uh, as well. Uh, he wrote Decameron, which was a series of uh, novellas that were um, associated with a backdrop of the Black Death uh, and all that. So he kind of survived the Black Death. He was from Florence. Uh, and so he, he was another great writer that's well known as well. Uh, Donatello, of course. Uh, Italian sculptor in the 1400s. Uh, he's also pretty important. He influenced other sculptors like Michelangelo later uh, to kind of develop their art uh, as well. Uh, one thing about the Italian sculptors, they started to use more nudity uh, in a lot of their statues. 
Uh, you know, that's something that they were heavily influenced by Greek Roman statues from a long time ago. So you start seeing you know, them copying that uh, and all that. He had an early version of the statue of David that's not as well known as the one by Michelangelo, but he's got one uh, that's well known as well. Uh, I'll mention Machiavelli also as well. He's another uh, famous figure in the Renaissance as well. Uh, he was an Italian writer uh, and diplomat. Uh, and he, he, of course, uh, lived in the Republic of Florence, uh, and he was known for his famous treatise, which was The Prince, uh, written in the 1530s, and was considered one of the first modern political treatises on how rulers can, you know, rule uh, in general, like how to stay in power and, th and things like that. And so that particular book uh, was highly influential in influencing a lot, of, a lot of political theory among monarchs of Europe um, at the time and later. It's still influential today. You will still read that book and they're still influenced by it uh, overall. So I was kind of mentioning some of these early, a lot of those were in the early Renaissance uh, that were involved there. But of course, you've got the ones I was going to talk about next, of course, which is the high Renaissance ones that you've got here, of course. Yeah, uh, those are, of course, the most famous overall uh, of the Renaissance artists that, are, of course, there right there. I think they say Michelangelo, uh, the one on the far right, uh, is considered the most famous uh, of them all. Uh, but yeah, I'll first talk about Da Vinci. Da Vinci, of course, uh, was considered one of the greatest artists, you know, of the high Renaissance. Uh, he's known for a lot of famous paintings that are people still, of course, look up to today, uh, which you can see there, one of the most famous he did was the Mona Lisa, uh, which is now uh, in the Louvre. Uh, but he's also known for the Last Supper, uh, which is a fresco painting that's now, of course, in Milan. Uh, and um, but he was known for all kinds of things. That's one thing about Da Vinci. Da Vinci was kind of this polymath, you know, that was a painter. He was a sculptor. He was an engineer, architect. Uh, he was he invented things. Uh, if you ever read the Da Vinci notebooks, you can see he had all kinds of crazy ideas. Like I think he had ideas of developing airplanes and helicopters and things like that before anybody else kind of created those ideas. Uh, so he was kind of kind of a man that was ahead of his time and all that, but. Vinci was kind of this perfectionist that couldn't finish his paintings, and uh, most of his paintings were never finished, if you know about that, about Da Vinci. Uh, there's the Last Supper painting, of course, uh, which has been done, uh, kind of redone, I think. It had to fix it up over the years, uh, but it depicts basically Jesus at the Last Supper, uh, when at the point when he says that one of his disciples, you know, has basically betrayed him, uh, which, of course, is, you know, Judas. So, um, Anyway, so yeah, you got that uh, Da Vinci, you know, the famous uh, master uh, artist, of course, known for the Mona Lisa uh, in general. Uh, also, of course, you don't forget you have David, uh, of course, Statue of David with Michelangelo. That's probably his greatest thing he's known for, uh, as you know. Uh, Michelangelo was predominantly a, a sculptor and painter. He was from, of course, Florin Florence as well. And uh, he's known for a lot of things. Uh, he, of course, was primarily known as a sculptor. I think that's what he saw himself first as, uh, more or less. But he was also a great painter uh, as well, uh, famous for painting the Sistine Chapel, uh, you know, in Rome. So I've got a kind of a painting of that as well. Of course, as you know, he painted most of the ceiling uh, of the Sistine Chapel Here's an example of the so-called creation of Adam, which is on the ceiling uh, right there. Later, he also uh, did, which is like a little later, well, he did the so-called Last Judgment, which is uh, behind the altar uh, in the Sistine Chapel. As well. I think that was done later, I want to say, around the 1530s. Uh, and um, why is the Sistine Chapel important? Uh, well, it's important because the fact that that's where they, if you know about the Catholic Church, the cardinals will choose the who the next pope is. That's why they go there to elect the next pope and all that. And so that's why that chapel is kind of important uh, at St. Peter's and all that in Rome. Now, um, anyway, uh, so yeah, you got Michelangelo, of course, very famous for his work as well. Uh, another great master I guess I'll mention about that I usually kind of talk about Raphael Sanzio, he's another 
famous painter that was also big and everybody's heard about uh, in the Renaissance. Uh, he was from Arbino in Italy, uh, and he, he also was involved in painting the Sistine Chapel as well. So you got other artists like him that were involved in it. He's known for like paintings like depictions of the Virgin Mary. They usually show her uh, images like there with baby Jesus usually holding him or something like that. And of course, he calls him Madonna. I think is the term the Italians use for sometimes for the Virgin Mary uh, and all that. So you got that painting that's kind of well known uh, as well. I think that other painting, the Madonna, the chair is well known uh, as well. But the painting that's uh, more famous today that they usually talk about that he's kind of real famous for, um, you know, uh, Sanzio, Ralph, Raphael Sanzio, of course, uh, is the so-called School of Athens, uh, which depicts uh, the Academy of Ancient Greece, uh, where I think in the middle of the painting you've got uh, Plato, you know, right here uh, next to Aristotle and other famous people that were part of, you know, ancient Greece uh, at the time. That's, I guess, in the so-called fourth century uh, BC and all that. So, so yeah, that's kind of basically, you know, uh, some of these great artists that were, you know, part part of the, you know, Renaissance that's there. Uh, but yeah, they have that, and you have the Northern Renaissance, of course, that that spread later uh, into Europe uh, and all that. And so, yeah, the Renaissance, uh, they think, helped to create the more modernized Europe uh, that would follow uh, afterwards, uh, and um, like I said, you know, you've got these other artists that were affected too. Like you've got uh, Geoffrey Chaucer. I say Geoffrey Chaucer, you know, was a, you know, uh, highly influential, you know, in the in the 15th century. He, he of course, uh, was seen as the so-called father of English literature, English poetry uh, afterwards because of him. And then you got William Shakespeare, you know, one of the greatest playwrights in any language uh, that you had that was also kind of part of the, later part of the Renaissance as well. I think some of you also talk about Erasmus. You ever heard of him in Germany? Uh, he was also big uh, in the Northern Renaissance as well of Dutch origins. Uh, so you have all these different people that were kind of affected by it. And even like I said, Christopher Columbus was, like I said, a Renaissance man uh, in general. So anyway, so yeah, like that's pretty much my lectures, of course, on uh, the Middle Ages. Um, if you have any, of course, comments, questions, of course, about about that, about really all the, all the lectures, of course, uh, on, on the Middle Ages, of course, let me know later uh, on my channel. Doesn't look like there's any comments today. I got questions more or less uh, about, about this lecture or previous lectures. But um, like I said, uh, this is pretty much going to wrap up the semester uh, of my lectures. Uh, like I said, don't forget about all the different assignments I'll have coming up uh, that, are, of course, are due. Uh, you know, I think you still got your vocab. Uh, that's still up, like the third vocab. You still can turn that in uh, if you have not done that yet. Uh, so I think I've got till Friday to kind of get that done. But I'm probably going to push back some of the Canvas quizzes. I might give you till Monday to wrap all of them up, uh, pretty much like six and seven. Uh, that's probably all I'm going to probably do uh, because, you know, next week will be kind of those that need to take the final. Uh, you need to kind of start working more on that, on the Middle Ages. And then also the book report uh, also as well. So those are, you know, topics that, you know, are going to be, of course, uh, important. So, yeah, I hope you all have a great uh, end of the semester. Uh, looks like a bunch of you all kind of sending me some messages there. Yeah, Madison, yeah, I hope you have a great weekend coming up. I uh, hope you all have a great also the end of the semester uh, coming up. Uh, and, um, yeah, take it easy. You know, you got the finals coming up uh, and all that. Uh, and, um, I do. I will have a review, like those that do have to take the final, you know, exam. And I'll have a little review, of course, going over the study guide uh, questions, of course, on the Middle Ages. So y'all's final is only going to be on the Byzantine Empire, rise of Islam, and of course the Middle Ages in Europe. Uh, so, so no, no Roman history uh, or anything, of course, on y'all's final. So, y'all take care. I hope y'all have a great rest of the summer uh, overall. Uh, like I said, if you have any comments, questions, you know, send me anything uh, about these lectures. And also, if you got a comment, question about the class, you can just go ahead and email me anytime you want, uh, night or day. And, of course, I'll, you know, send you a comment later about it. So, y'all take care. Um, like I said, have a great re rest of the summer, uh, more or less.